So uh, lastly, uh, for the session, we're going to have a, a talk by uh, Ray Lee, who's uh, an assistant professor in the uh, Department of Radiology at UNC. It's not that many years ago when people started putting PET scans and CT scans together, and that really allowed major changes in localization. Now there's the capability to put PET scans and MR scans together. And Dr. Lee will tell us if it makes any sense, right? <laughs> the advantage of speaking last about the most expensive technology possible here um, is also that everybody else has spoken about everything else interesting. So I could literally take Dr. Hyslips and Dr. Wong's, put them together, and essentially I've got most of my talk. Um, thankfully, there's still some interesting things in terms of integration. And I um, want to thank the committee for allowing me the chance to talk about our new device that was just recently installed at the BRIC uh, a little less than, well, just this year and the fourth in the nation, which is a full PET MR scanner. We'll come back to that in a second. I'm very interested as sort of the PhD side of me and also the MD side of me of making sure that the imaging tools that we use can actually or are of actual benefit to patients. And so uh, hence my title, um, since I often accuse the PhDs, including myself, that we're just looking for nails most of the time. So in terms of going with the tradition now of following uh, the historical areas or looking back at the history, um, the evolution of PET, of course, PET was invented in the 50s and 60s. Um, uh, conventional devices uh, didn't really start occurring until the late 1990s. Townsend and Nutt was credited for the first integrated PET CT scanner. Um, this is sort of at the early part of my PhD, and so during, actually, as I attended multiple RSNAs, our big radiology meeting, um, all of a sudden PET CT was introduced in 2003. Um, this is to differentiate itself from a standalone PET unit, and by 2004, the majority of PET scanners were sold with a CT. So that sort of reflects the importance of the anatomy component um, uh, to be added to the PET component. Practically, the other major reason, uh, besides making it easy for us to interpret the images, is the attenuation correction that's needed by the PET in order to do quantitative uh, PET imaging. Uh, PET-MR was actually described in 1997 or earlier. Uh, 2006 was the earliest demonstration of a simultaneous acquisition. We'll talk about why that was non-trivial. And 2011, of course, is the FDA approval of the fully integrated PET-MR system. Um, uh, I'm a little biased uh, to our Siemens system because it is a fully integrated system, but you'll see why I think that's uh, sort of important. Um, approaches to PET-MR, of course, first of all, that we can uh, use a common patient table approach, the Philips Ingenuity TF uh, device, which is one of the first sort of commercially available PET-MR combined systems, basically takes a uh, patient table that you can slide onto the PET side here and then slide into the MR side of things. Um, GE has proposed a similar system now with a PET-CT and MR, so one can argue if this is a PET-CT MR and now three modalities. Um, uh, but in, in essence, they do the exact same thing, which is basically that you have two physical systems. The advantage is that in terms of integration, you don't have any, many of the uh, integration concerns physically where the MR remains fully shielded. It shouldn't interact too much with the uh, PET scanner, which is located far enough away. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, while there's a lot of engineering involved, there's really minimal integration issues. And there shouldn't be any significant crosstalk between the two devices because you're never going to be acquiring from one device or the other device at the same time. Disadvantages, of course, in an era where space obviously remains important, um, all of a sudden you've got to take up one patient in the area where two scanners need to uh, locally reside. Um, you have to have the shielding considerations for both the nuclear medicine side, uh, radioactive shielding, plus the MR shielding. Um, that becomes very expensive and non-trivial for uh, such a large area. And like I said, my bias is that this is not true simultaneous acquisition, so therefore are you really taking advantages of both modalities? Uh, to take a step back, what about performing simple fusion? We uh, often obviously fuse the PET side of things with a CT that's automated in the workflow in the nuclear medicine reading room. But when we looked at it, uh, we actually did a retrospective um, study with a medical student working closely with me and looked at, because I'm a, uh, biased from the neuroradiology side of things, brains for which we happen to have enough of the uh, PET portion covering the brain to be interesting. And so we went back and looked at uh, a large number of studies to identify cases like this, and this is just one example. We have a T1 post-contrast uh, MR image, the PET image, um, I've not included the CT, and then we fused them together. This took, after finding the actual cases, this is, uh, these are brain mets from the lung primary, 
but the actual time to do this was less than five minutes using existing software that's sitting right there on the computer on the um, nuclear medicine workstations. Obviously, in terms of cost to the institution, it's almost non-existent, and it just becomes either technologist or uh, radiologist time. So the capability of performing simple perfusion exists, and I'd be hard-pressed to believe that not every single person who's at a medical institution right now does have this capability. It just might be hiding under a leaf somewhere, um, and probably known to the physicists, but, um, uh, and uh, at least to the nuclear medicine side of things. So this is relatively straightforward. So obviously, we want to go beyond this to justify um, you know, a multi-million dollar device and uh, to also look for new applications. So what's the actual problem, of course? This is about the rough size of a normal PET scanner. This is the rough size of a, a pretty conventional MR scanner. We've got to somehow take this entire PET scanner and squeeze it into something that's going to fit within the MR scanner because of the attenuation of the helium, uh, helium um, that surround the helium um, bottle that surrounds essentially the coils on the MR scanner. Obviously, we can't put the PET scanner surrounding the MR scanner, um, so that's the actual physical problem. It turns out there are other f barriers to full integration. There's an intense magnetic field, um, obviously, within the MR scanner, and so the PET detectors and electronics need to be uh, magnetically shielded or not be sensitive to the magnetic fields. A huge issue, which um, is will probably will turn up to be the 800-pound gorilla um, in the room that nobody's that people are paying attention to but trying not to talk about um, is that we don't have great methods for PET attenuation correction. It turns out, um, even though that on the PET-CT side of things, normally we derive the, use the CT for the attenuation correction, but unfortunately we need to derive these for the MR sequences. And Essentially, the greatest attenuation comes from bone. As all of you know, MR <coughs> visualization of bone, or at least cortical bone or hard bone, basically, is, minim is poor at best. And so therefore, we really need to do a, a full paradigm shift in terms of how do we approach MR acquisitions in order to provide appropriate quantification on the PET side of things uh, to derive the attenuation. Um, additionally, one other thing that we've sort of encountered um, as we've learned about the system is that everything in this photon path needs to be accounted for. Um, for What's already been done partially to a certain extent is MRI coils, for example. There, um, Dr. Heislip showed a, uh, the breast coils. Well, you have to have attenuation correction for the breast coils if they're going to be inside a PET MR. But simple things, as, as simple as headphones, need to be accounted for. If you place headphones around somebody's brain, that needs to be accounted for in terms of the attenuation correction. Um, so never mind EKG leads and things like that. We can sort of uh, avoid some of those things, but anything more substantial needs to be accounted for. So the MR, on the MR acquisition side of things, it's not simply a PET, MR, PET and an MR acquisition. There needs to be forethought into how you integrate the two scans simultaneously. The patient is giving off radiation because of the PET injectable tracer, but the MR sequences need to be timed or tuned so that you're acquiring appropriate motion information when needed and things like that. This is very, very ongoing. Um, as the recent sort of PETMR focused meetings. And once again, these are also usually the areas of weakest for MR have been also the uh, areas of traditional CT strengths. Classically, um, PET CT is great for lung cancer. Unfortunately, that's exactly where MR is relatively weak. Um, the same for the bone. The key enabling technology that's allowed simultaneous acquisition of PETMRs has really been these avalanche photodiodes. I'm not going to go heavy into the physics, but basically these are, are, operate, can operate in a high field environment, and they're much smaller than conventional photomultiplier tubes. Uh, typically, photomultiplier tubes are four to five inches long as a minimum number of the full support electronics. If you were to take a ring of those and put it inside a scanner, you can, how much, you can imagine how, much, uh, how little space is left. These are the current avalanche photodiodes. You can see this is 32 millimeters in dimension here. These are it right here, about two millimeters in depth. One, the reason I like this picture is because it also shows that these things, uh, the APDs, require integrated cooling channels to operate. Um, the MR is cooled itself, of course, because of the superconducting uh, helium um, down near zero, zero Kelvin, but unfortunately the APDs themselves also uh, require cooling, and um, though not to uh, as low a temperature, uh, this has become a failure mode for many of the MR scanners that we've learned about. Uh, there's some simple driver um, boards and electronics that can sit on the, that need to sit close to the APDs, but that's a relatively straightforward uh, area of development. These APDs are provide direct readout. People have tried other techniques to integrate the systems, and it turns out this is the key technology that's really allowed um, the development of a truly simultaneous PET-MR. This is, uh, 
a cutaway for the inside of the uh, Siemens Biograph MMR, the RF coil that uh, sits normally close to the patient to, to generate the MR signal sits here. The APD sit in a layer beyond that, and then the standard gradient coils, which allow spatial localization, sit beyond that. And so this is a picture of our PET MR scanner. Um, this is one of our technologists uh, giving a sense of scale. It obviously looks like an MR scanner. Well, essentially all scanners to me look essentially the same these days, but it's just a little more bulky. Um, and the bore size, they used a large bore MR to begin with and then took away some of that space. So it still can fit larger patients. Um, in the state of North Carolina, however, there are still a high enough percentage of patients that don't fit in this scanner or uh, our other scanners. Um, but that's what it looks like. I want to give you some examples uh, that both images acquired at UNC and uh, some other institutions. This is from a study by Dr. Chera and Ben Huang from um, our department uh, of head and neck cancer imaging. This is a PET fused uh, PET, FDG PET, and T1 post contrast image. This is the actual separate PET image, so we know what it looks like. Um, this is the T1 post contrast and the T2 image. The key that you're looking at, the little hot spot, uh, which I think everybody can see, is actually a little lymph node um, in this patient. So this gives you an idea of the fusion of the exquisite anatomy that is available from MR, and then obviously the functional imaging that comes from the PET side of things. Uh, borrowing from Dr. Dresga um, in Germany, the German um, it's sort of interesting how they funded their research into the PET-MR side of things. Um, apparently, quite a few institutions have PET-MR devices, and the way it was described to me was the government said, work together. Um, we'll give you lots of money, but you have to work together, and therefore, the Germans have been some of the most productive in terms of looking at PET-MR uh, in terms of new application, things like that. Um, the, this is an example from uh, Dr. Dresga of lymphoma within the neck showing both the CT, low-dose CT, fusion of the uh, FDG and CT image, demonstrating this large uh, sort of lymph node mass on the left, uh, patient left, and then on the uh, a smaller lymph node on the right. Obviously with classic CT, especially low-dose non-contrast, we know the lymph node's there because of mass effect, but it's obviously very hard to see. Um, once we use an MR instead uh, that gives us better anatomy, the T2-weighted image demonstrates the node uh, very clearly as a very, very bright uh, image, uh, very bright area on the image, and, and the same for the opposite side. And we can see that those nodes are obviously lighting up also. One should ask immediately, well, what's the difference in the separating two scans and then fusing them together? And at this point in time, my opinion is, not a whole lot, since we're not really, we're taking advantage of the anatomy, but there's no reason temporarily that they can't be acquired separately and then fused together afterwards. Um, in terms of body imaging performed at UNC thus far, this is Dr. Rathmel's uh, small pilot study looking at renal cell cancer, um, a combination of basically can uh, the MR imaging combined with the PET imaging provide additional information for either staging or characterization purposes. Uh, T2-weighted image, we have a large renal lesion, that's the kidney in circumference, and that's the lesion taking up, uh, or at least in this plane, most of the kidney. Um, you can see that actually there's PET uptake, but this is in the collecting system, the calyces of the kidney, um, pre- and post-contrast MR that demonstrates obviously the enhancing normal parenchyma and then the uh, renal lesion uh, within it. So this is an example of simultaneous imaging in an area of the body that uh, CT is strong, but I think MR still gives us more anatomy and anatomic information than classic uh, uh, CT. Here's an example from uh, Germany once again of where I would assume as a first path that we have weakness on the MR side of things. This is um, uh, melanoma metastases to the lung. This is the FDG. This is the low-dose CT where we can obviously see a mass lesion that also is lighting up when we uh, look at the fusion with the FDG PET. We can use some of the newer novel um, uh, MR sequences that allow better lung imaging. Classically, obviously, we don't image the lung because of the susceptibility artifact, but because of the same sequences that allow us to image the bone better, also allows us to image the lung better, that the fusion image on the PET-MR allows us to see the lesion almost just as well, I think, and clearly uh, with the PET information that we know it's an active lesion and a lesion of concern. So I think from this aspect of things, actually, um, in terms of whole body screening, looking at um, some of the classic capabilities from the PET CT side of things, that MR isn't far behind, especially if we're screening for metastases, um, uh, even across the body parts that are generally difficult for MR uh, 
classically. Here's another example um, of how we can really, I think, start to take advantages of the MR side of things. This is just a stir axial image demonstrating um, the um, a lesion at the left base of tongue. You can see how bright it is when it's fused with the MR PET. This gives us anatomy. On the CT side of things, you would just see slightly bulk, uh, more bulky mass in this region, and this is a lesion better directly visualized. Um, the advantage, of course, Dr. Heislop also alluded to, is that we can incorporate diffusion-weighted imaging and look at that and also get an, uh, an idea that there's restricted diffusion, suggesting that there's a hypercellular mass in that region. So this is taking advantage of the additional capabilities that uh, Dr. Heislop also alluded to, delivered by MR, and then enhancing that with functional information given by the PET. So I'm very glad uh, Dr. Wong went through the tracer, so I don't need to. Um, the two ones that we use most often are FDG and sodium fluoride for bone metastases. Um, there's lots of other ones that are uh, um, up and coming. Given the fights associated with Amivid, and that's an Alzheimer's imaging agent, I'm sort of uh, wondering how long it'll be before we have these available on the clinical side and not for the research side of things. But um, I think there's still a lot of potential to look at uh, looking at tumor progression um, and biomarkers of treatment effect using some of these agents. Uh, thankfully, the neuroendocrine uh, Dototoc PET um, uh, was already alluded to by Dr. Wong, which saves me time. But here is a basically a conventional PET CT image where we see on the PET imaging with a neuroendocrine um, uh, a neuroendocrine tumor that lights up brightly here. It's very, very hard to see by uh, conventional CT. Uh, the fusion suggests that there's a lesion there, but that may not be sufficient for a, a surgeon to have a hard target. Uh, MR imaging, I think, displays the lesion somewhat better um, so that uh, we can uh, localize the lesion somewhat better um, with the fused PET MR combined. Uh, combined modality, I think this offers the surgeon somewhat more information, um, and obviously we have something to follow up with on the MR side of things also. But this is an example of using novel tracers and the PET-MR situation. So these are my two cents of the true nails in oncology. Um, I'm speaking more broadly only because there's such a wide variety of um, uh, sort of primary cancer specialties in the audience, but really I think we really can use it to enhance some of the strengths of MR, take advantage of the strengths of MR combined with the physiologic information offered by the PET. First of all, soft tissue imaging, abdomen and pelvis classically are very strong strengths of MR. A lot of our initial studies that are being performed at UNC are going to focus on these areas. Musculoskeletal, I think, is an area um, that's often sort of overlooked uh, to a certain extent, but I think the, the exquisite ability of MR to identify lesions allows us really a lot of opportunities. This includes spine from and of course, my biases in the brain, um, I've noticed that uh, pretty much nobody's really shown a lot of images of the brain for um, classic reasons. I think uh, FDG PET isn't as useful in the brain, but I think looking at brain metastases and looking to the future, there's a huge area of opportunity there. Partially because of this, is, which is the blood-brain barrier, and that uh, MR is exquisitely effective at measuring that directly. And so we can take that information and combine it with the PET kinetics and offer much more information by combining sort of the physiologic MR and the functional imaging of PET uh, to really perform true quantitative imaging. The obvious application, I think, um, which unfortunately doesn't bill as well, is pediatric imaging. Essentially, the PET MR removes the CT radiation dose completely, so therefore the total dose of the patient is roughly half. Um, obviously, we're for following up children again and again and again. This is a huge issue. Um, one thing that's over, overlooked even by radiologists is that a patient, a, a, the age at which your radiation sensitivity drops to a, a flat line is actually at the age of 35. Um, this is much higher than most people expect. It's, there's a nice New England Journal article that re, uh, talks about this. And um, I try to remind our residents um, whenever teaching, basically, that we need to be cognizant that that radiation sensitivity falls up at such a late age and not age 18 when our protocols change over to adult protocols. There's a trade-off of mildly increased scan time, but I think it's worth it for the radi reduced radiation dose. So I want us to avoid the nail syndrome. Obviously, a PET-MR is a very expensive device to have to upkeep on both sides of things. The tracers are very ex expensive, uh, especially for the novel tracers. So we always have to ask ourselves, can simple fusion or advanced existing techniques answer the question? And I think in many cases, absolutely yes. I think as we try to push both fronts, um, we'll find areas where MR may be sufficient, used in a particular way, and the same for uh, uh, novel PET tracers. 
Simultaneous PET MR should not simply be the addition of PET plus MR. I think it should be much greater than that. And obviously, we want to be uh, somewhat greater than uh, the whole should be somewhat greater uh, than the sum of the parts here. Um, there should be, I think, appropriate integration of imaging into trials. I think that's one area where radiologists need to take a much more active role in helping incorporate them in sort of uh, incorporating the useful information that we can deliver um, and also providing sort of some logic testing in terms of will, will radiology or something that we're doing actually answer that question. An important area really that needs to be addressed more carefully, uh, Dr. Wong alluded to it, but even more so for PET-MR is quantification and specifically the attenuation correction error. Uh, that needs to be done. There's a lot of good work in non uh, areas that aren't close to bone, but at the skull base, areas that I'm specifically interested in, the spine and things like that, quantification remains a major issue. Um, some practical considerations. Billing, uh, how do we charge for a PETMR? That's a very big question on, on our side of things right now. Um, there's a lot of education, I think, for um, complex modalities as we're sort of learning at our institution. Um, there's patient comfort. I showed uh, Amber without the coils on it, but this is what she actually looks like when she's getting ready for the PET-MR. So you can see it looks like she's completely mummified. Um, and there's obviously a need for a source of tracers, either an on-site psychotron or a commercial source. So these are just some of the things that uh, we need to consider. I want to quickly acknowledge uh, Dr. Lynn, the director of the BRIC, and Dr. Ann for her contributions on the MR side of things. Bryce Kessler has been doing the hard work on the fusion and the BRIC staff for their work on uh, trying to get our system up and running. Thank you.